Welcome to Essence House. Did you know the hit podcast is now a novel on Kickstarter? Find out more at EssenceHouseStory.com. Studio Urbo and Bonfire Press present Essence House by Eric J. Cockrell and Chuck Pino. Read by Michael Goodrick. Chapter 17. Welcome back, Sorensen. A large, almost Hulk-like old man leaned against the wine rack on the wall. Another day in this damned room, he thought as he rose to his feet. By now, he'd all but forgotten how it used to be his favorite room on his property. Not only did it hold several generations of the finest wine, but it also was the quickest access point to the essence. And he was not the most patient man on the planet. He walked over to the suit jacket hanging on a hook on the wall, removed it, and brushed his hand over it to clear off the dust. He slid one arm into the jacket, and with his arm raised in the air, he filled the other sleeve with his remaining arm, then bringing both arms back to tug at the back and straighten himself up. If I break from this hell, I'm going to have to stock toothpaste down here, he joked to himself. It wasn't the first time he'd considered storing some toiletries. Hell, it wasn't even the first time he'd made that joke. He strode across the room, as he had every day for what seemed like centuries, to a dark bottle of wine near the door. His reflection shone nearly perfectly lifelike in the bottle's glass. He stood there, running his fingers through his long, graying blonde hair like a comb. He reached over and grabbed his red necktie and tossed it around his neck. With a few masterful motions, the tie neatly adorned his dirty white shirt. I'm going to have to pay Elena triple to get the stains out of this shirt when I return, he chuckled to himself. It was not the first time he'd made that joke either. So Tim is stuck in World War II with your grandfather, Jessica said, pulling a seat behind her as she slumped down. Now what do we do? Tristan continued to stare at the poster. Celeste turned to Jessica. That seems to be the size of it. We could probably use the stick to take us there, but damn if that doesn't sound like a nightmare. I was ready for 1995. I lived through that year, and even so, I studied the hell out of it for 18 months before attempting to visit it, Tristan finally spoke. Why did you visit 1995, Tristan? His cousin asked. I thought I could save them. I thought I could save my mother and maybe turn my life around, he explained. Jessica stood from the chair and put a hand on Tristan's shoulder. I'm sorry, Tristan, but I guess in hindsight, I'm grateful that you did, or I'd not be here with any of you today. Celeste's head dropped and her face screamed of discomfort. What's the matter, cuz? Tristan said with concern. I've just always felt a great deal of guilt regarding that night. It was me that your parents were going to see. It's so tragic, and... My entire life, it's felt like I was partly responsible, she explained. Stop that right now. Not one ounce of this is your fault. The four of them ignored every weather warning. Barnabas attacked and killed the one man trying to make it right. Gramps sent everyone into that situation. And me and Tim botched our chance at fixing it. But you? You feel guilt? You weren't at fault. He reached out and embraced his cousin. You were merely born into this mess. The two hugged, but it was short-lived as the door swung open and slammed against the wall. The old man took a seat at the table in the corner of the cellar. He picked up a dusty black shoe from the ground and placed it on the table. Pulling a soiled handkerchief from his pocket, he spit on the shoe and wiped vigorously. After a small bit of time, a semi-shine returned to the black leather. He placed it on the ground, slipped his foot inside, and tied the laces. He grabbed the other shoe and placed it on the table to repeat the routine. The same routine he'd been following for as long as he could remember. Well, at least since a month or two, or hell, maybe a year or two after the wine ran out. Time was impossible to keep track of. The slam of the door startled the three Essence Guard members. What are you doing here? said the shaky, young, blonde-haired security guard as he drew his gun. 
Jessica quickly sprung from her seat and grabbed the walking stick from Celeste. Before he could fire his weapon, the three were gone. The young man stood there, trembling. What the hell was that? The place was a strange place indeed, but this was an extra kind of strange. He pulled out his two-way radio and held down the button. Hey guys, I need someone to come back to the offices. Something isn't right, and I could use some backup. His hands continued to shake as he struggled to put the device away. Travis, what's the deal? said a voice from the doorway. I opened the door and there were three people in here talking. I interrupted them and they just vanished, Travis replied, still confused. I just don't know. I don't think I'm seeing things, Katrina. No, I don't think you are either, she replied. I'm going to call Greta. Katrina turned off the light and she and Travis headed down the hall. Another day in this damned room, the man thought, as he again awoke from his slumber. The same thought he'd had for years, even decades probably. He wouldn't even be surprised if it were centuries or millennia. He took a few steps to where his suit jacket hung and began to dust off his sleeve. He thought of toothpaste and poor Elena having to scrub out the stains on his filthy white shirt. He was going to pay her triple, he thought. He tied his tie around his neck, ran his fingers through his hair, cleaned his shoes, and as he did most of the day, he pulled his chair to the door and sat, waiting, with a smile. The door of Greta's car swung open and she nodded to the man holding the handle as she exited. For the first time in her entire life, she was excited to return to the Musée de Essence. That the property still stood and remained in her family's name was quite a feat. It could be referred to as a miracle, but she put too much work into it to surrender that credit to the gods. And now she returned with a cornerstone. Finally, her family could regain what was rightfully theirs. The man closed the door after her and she instructed, Call the men back to the site beside the building. Then go ahead and pull this thing around to the garages. I'm heading in to review some security footage. Absolutely, the man replied with a nod and stepped away with drawing a phone from his pocket. Greta left the man to do as she asked, and she made her way to the steps of the Musée. Today was the day. Today, she would finally make her family proud in a way that none of them could manage for her. She hated to think in such terms, but she was raised by a family that dwelled on failure. Her father mismanaged much of what the family was left with after they were robbed of the essence. She recalled how her grandfather had dedicated much of his time to looking for clues to its whereabouts. She came from a big house, and the Sorensen's waning prestige served her fairly well through life. But she was held back by a family that had given in to failure and was content to grovel. As she stepped through the doorway, the lady selling tickets smiled. Miss Sorensen, welcome home. Thank you, dear. Could you phone security and tell them I'm on my way? she said with a returned smile. Yes, ma'am, the ticket teller replied. Greta continued into the main lobby of the building. Even in her failure, her success in this place made her proud. She remembered when the idea of a museum dedicated to time travel occurred to her, where her father and his father before him had struggled to reach out and find clues to the whereabouts of the cornerstone or other access to the essence. She had the idea to create a hub for such things and let the essence come to them. It was only a matter of time, and admission to the museum could give them the financial boost they needed in order to continue their outreach. And she was right. Her father had searched high and low, and she even took on some expeditions, but none of them bore fruit. It was this building, as a reservoir for time travel knowledge, that won the day. She withdrew her cell phone that buzzed in her pocket. Milo, how long before we're ready to install it? With the land cleared yesterday, I'd say within the hour, Miss Sorensen. I know how anxious you are, he answered. Very well. Alert me when you have it set. Thank you, Milo, she said, returning her phone to her pocket. She rounded a corner and headed toward the door marked security. As she approached the door, it swung open. 
Oh, welcome back, Miss Sorensen, Travis greeted her. Greta took a look at his name badge and returned a greeting. I hope you've been well, Travis. You're the one that found our guest, correct? I am, yes, he replied nervously. Please, stay. I'd like you there as I review the footage. She held the door and gestured him back in with a smile. The office was not especially comfortable. White walls, an off-white desk that was more like an extended shelf mounted to the wall. A small black-and-white monitor displayed the office in question. All right, gentlemen, let's see what we have here. She stood back, arms crossed. The man at the desk pressed the play button on the recording device, and the still screen sprang to life. The picture was not exactly high quality, but it would do. The three watched as three people entered the office and poured over files. There was some discussion around a poster, when Travis could be seen entering, and within a moment, the three intruders vanished completely. What did that one do? Greta asked, pointing to Jessica on the screen. Honestly, I don't even know. It all happened so fast. Travis was nervous. She took her hands off of the monitor and turned them to Travis. Travis, your job is to observe. Please, tell me what you observed, that you may keep your job, she said, asserting a threatening tone. Yes, ma'am, it did happen quickly. I seem to recall maybe a cane of some kind. I thought she was going to hit me, and I was ready to fire my gun, when they all just disappeared completely, Travis recounted. Greta's phone rang and she pressed the screen to accept the call. Thank you, Travis. You two keep this under wraps. I have business to attend to. She turned her attention to her phone as she exited the room. Milo, I hope this is good news. Milo could not wait to deliver this message. Congratulations, Miss Sorensen. You have restored your family's honor. Greta was speechless. She knew this was coming, but it hadn't been real to her yet. Thank you, Milo. I'm heading to the basement. Please stand by. She ended her phone call and headed toward the staircase to the basement. She was never very fond of the basement. Just a large, creepy, wide-open space with some items stored along one wall and a door in the back to a wine room that had been decommissioned for some time. But today, that room was her reason for visiting. She gracefully walked across the mostly empty room and strode right up to the door. The floor trembled slightly, and the light in the room dimmed considerably. Sounds began emerging all around her, and slowly retreated to angry whispers in the corners. She stood there a moment to compose herself properly. Turning the knob, she pulled the door back. There, she found the wine room just as expected, but with a chair facing the door, and a man seated in the chair. The large man stood up. Greta. Wow, it is you. How do you know me? She asked. You know who I am, right? He replied with a question. I do. You're my great-grandfather, Hans Sorensen. Now, how is it that you know me? We've never met that I'm aware of. Hans stepped toward her. Sweetheart, we've met, just not yet. And I suspect that if that is to still happen, we've got some work to do. Greta stood there staring. She did it. What exactly did she do, though? She didn't know exactly how to feel. Hans put his arm around her, and the two walked across the room and up the stairs. What year is it, darling? Hans asked. 2020, she replied. Wow, I'm glad to see this place endured, he offered. Greta quickly responded. Against all odds, I have to admit... It had been on the verge of collapse for decades, but I've built it back up and have been working on regaining our family's former wealth. Hans smiled to see so much of his own drive in his descendant. I can help you with that, my dear. But first, I need a bath. Is my bedchamber still intact? It is. It's mine now, Greta confirmed. Well, great-grandpa's back after one hell of a long time. It's mine now, he condescended. Of course, I'll have some things rearranged to restore it as it was, she said uneasily. 
Can I leave you to explore while I make some arrangements? Please do, Hans demanded as he turned to make his way down the hall. Over the next few weeks, Greta actually had very little contact with Hans. He was either busy at what was formerly her desk, making notes while web browsing, or he was just gone altogether. Hans was making plans, and he wasn't very forthcoming with the details. He'd even set up a kind of workspace in the basement and declared that portion of the building off-limits. Greta could not believe it had been three weeks since she'd re-established the family's access to the essence. And in all that time, she'd not even been allowed to experience it once. Miss Sorensen? A voice spoke out from behind her, waking her from a daze. Oh, yes, she addressed the young lady that had approached. Liam asked if I could find you to have a discussion about a private party rental, the woman explained. I'm about to head to the basement to have an important talk right now, but maybe when I return, Greta offered. Thank you, ma'am, the girl said as she turned and headed back down the hall. Greta was anxious. She wanted to have a conversation with her great-grandfather about his dealings. She had spent her entire life saving his legacy, and she wanted to be a part of it. She headed toward the stairwell when her phone rang in her pocket. She looked at the number and smiled. Well, this should be interesting. She pressed the screen. Mr. Edmund, it's been a while. I understand that some of my family visited you a couple days ago. Tim Edmund took as gracious a tone as he could offer. Oh, I don't recall that, but it doesn't surprise me. Your family doesn't know how to leave my family alone, Mr. Edmund, she replied. If you've done anything to harm them, Tim was interrupted. I haven't been bothered by your people in nearly a month. They were here while I was in America, and they quite literally vanished before my security guard's eyes, Greta snapped angrily. And you still have the cornerstone? Tim asked. Of course we have the stone, Greta shouted. It's ours. It belongs to my family. You have no idea what your family has taken from us. I do have some idea, Greta. I was there. Listen, I decided to make this call to try to resolve this as adults, Tim explained. I'm not the bad guy here, Timothy. The stone is back where it belongs. You and your family are the villains in this story. She shouted again. Heroes? Villains? Come on, Greta. None of it is that simple, and I think you know it. This isn't a movie, Tim explained. No matter. I don't have your family, and even if it was completely up to me, I don't see how we could come to a peaceful resolution, Greta conceded. Tim pleaded. Isn't it worth discussing, Greta? You've done some awful things, but I'm not sure you're an awful person. In my family probably seems pretty shady to you, but I swear, it's all been in the interest of protecting the essence. It seems like we should be able to find a compromise. It's not about ownership. It's about safety and protection. The essence can bring about some bad things. The phone went silent on Greta's end. Greta? Greta? Tim sought a response. Tim Edmund? A male voice finally responded. Hello? Yeah, it's me. Who is this? Tim asked. I've heard a lot about you, Timothy. Seems I knew your grandfather. As Hans spoke, sounds emerged behind him, again like angry whispers. Hans Sorensen? What did you do to Greta? Where are my family? Tim spoke with a great deal of concern. Your family? I don't give a rat's ass about your family. Your family trapped me for what felt like millennia. You can't even begin to understand what that does to a man. Hans grew angrier. Listen, Hans, I've actually been there, trapped in the stone, lost in my mind, even displaced in time as you have become. Tim was interrupted for the second time during the phone call. Hans growled. The council and your family set the events in motion that caused that as well. I could crush every one of them. I will crush them all. No mercy. Do not expect me to spare a soul. When I find the council, they will regret interfering with me, and nobody will stand in my way again. I think we can make this right, Hans. 
Roland didn't want to trap you as you were. Hell, it wasn't even the council that trapped you. It was your deal with the Nazi party that sealed your fate, Tim shouted. Roland was spying on me long before I spoke to the Germans. And you know what? Roland may be the key to bringing the council out of hiding. Thanks for that, kid. I know exactly how to end this. Theme music by Carol Cockrell.